The stars of Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman experienced a memorable six-year run on network television. When asked to choose their favorites, the cast each had moments that stood out, especially the good doctor. I think Washita was uh, very, very strong. I particularly liked the race. The birth was a fabulous two-parter. The wedding one was wonderful. When we did the one with Barbara Babcock about uh, breast cancer and how she didn't want to have her breast removed. I think, you know, the one about the burning of the books. I think that was a really, really important episode. For co-star Joe Lando, the show's finest hour was also its first. I think the pilot kind of really set the standard of what the show was going to be, who these people were, whom were they, who were they really fighting you know, for or against. Um, I think that was the best and finest hour. I, and I think every show after that tried to rise up to that level of excellence. It was quintessential Dr. Quinn, nobody does it better, and, and still holds up. Chad Allen recalls his favorite was as controversial as it was creative. Beth wrote an episode about Walt Whitman coming to town that touched on the issue of homosexuality and uh, acceptance of all people. Cheyenne believed that some folks are like that naturally. Hey, Emma. Hey. Man woman is what they call them. They're respected just like every other member of the tribe. It was not considered by many to be um, in the vein of what uh, Dr. Quinn was about, family values. But Beth Sullivan and, and, and those of us on the show understood that uh, our definition of family values extended beyond simply traditional ideas and that it was about love and that um, love was about acceptance. Well, Mr. Whitman's poems ask us to look at certain things in a new way. What's wrong with that? Well, nothing. It's just that sometimes people are afraid of new ideas. It was very important to her to make that episode. Um, it was very important to me that that episode get made. True to form, Orson Bean's choice scored high with all the cast and crew. We actually had to play baseball. Well, we got so into baseball that we were playing baseball during the lunch hour. We played baseball all day in, in the show, and when we were off, we were playing baseball, and the little kids had, had their own baseball team going, and we just became baseball crazy that week. It was so much fun. Dr. Quinn's Gray Fox also found a way to save time after the games were over. Actors know, once you've been on a show long enough, that if there's some noise or something in the background, or um, that you're going to end up having to loop your lines, which means you're going to have to go back in post-production and, and, and sort of lip sync to your own image up on the screen. And it can be a pain. There was a, uh, a motor that made the bubbles in this natural spring, and it was noisy. So Orson, in order to, very, thinking very cleverly, in order to make it easier for himself to loop, all the lines he was saying like this. Oh, nobody's going to want to come out to see replacement players. <laughs> Tricks of the trade. When you're old, you learn this stuff. In picking favorites, certain episodes were a toss-up. I think the start of the second year, we, we had traveled to Boston to visit uh, Grandma. And I hated that. I liked uh, the, I think it was the first show of the second season where I went to Boston to find Dr. Mike because my heart was aching for her. I had grown another one of my summer adventures, had grown my hair out really long and I really wanted Matthew to have long hair in the second year. And the uh, designers curled it up in some crazy just hairdo and font and I hated it, I couldn't stand it. Having Sully thrust into this history of Dr. Mike that was so in contrast to his. And, and we were filming in these outfits, it was, you know, really hot. You get all dressed up and, uh, and learn to dance and learn to, you know, use the right fork and that was it was funny stuff. I just wanted it to be over with. I couldn't stand it. One Mammoth co-star was unforgettable, yet unbearable. How often do you get to work with a nine-foot Kodiak? The bear was very scary. We thought this bear was tame. There was one day on the set where we were working with this bear, and it was supposed to just run and chase the, the stunt lady into the cabin and stop there. The bear hadn't read the script. The bear ran in. But it just kept going. And mercifully, she was a stunt girl, so she was able to throw herself out of the other window and somehow close the door. And you never saw a crew move so fast. You thought it was lunch. Every member of the crew, including the park rangers, climbed trees. Except the guys around the camera where I was shooting my little video, we were told not to move quickly. And if you did, the bear would chase you. It was hysterically funny. During his favorite animal scene, 
Orson encountered a slightly more civilized beast. When they wrote the show, they didn't realize that there's a certain time of the year when bears hibernate, and there was no bear to be had. They were all asleep in the United States of America. So the bear was a guy in a bear suit, and, and they kept the camera dark, and the poor guy was sweating in this bear suit and going, rah, rah. <laughs> and it was some of the best acting I ever did, trying to keep from laughing and, and, and look terrified at this poor guy in the bear suit. <laughs> They had a couple of stock shots for the long shots, but the frightening animal was a guy in a rather moth-eaten bear suit. And which high-flying episode got under everyone's skin? I know the answer. The circus show. <laughs> I spent a lot of time hanging upside down. Probably the dumbest one was the one where we became circus performers. The death-defying trapeze. I didn't buy the story, and I didn't buy the girl with the web fingers who was in the thing. <laughs> I'm reading this thing, and I said, I am what? I am on a flying trapeze. Have you, are you unaware of the fact that I flunked gym, gymnastics because I just have absolutely no upper body strength at all, and I can't, for my life, hang on to anything? And I'm afraid of heights. So high. <laughs> you ready? No. I mean, where did you get this crazy idea? The most amazing thing with me is you can get me to do things that Jane Seymour was terrified of doing. But once I get up there and I put myself into character, um, or for some reason that character is capable of doing it. So I did fly on that flying trapeze and it terrified me. But when they said, action, that's it. Orson found even the memory of another show to be painful. My unfavorite episode was one in which I'm going somewhere in my wagon and I have an accident and I break my leg and uh, Sully has to rescue me. I put my arm around him, I'm limping on my one leg. Well, we shot it for days, and we shot it with scene after scene of me limping on the one leg, and it really hurt my leg, and I wound up having to have an operation on my knee. I mean, I'm gonna be 75 next month, and, and I should have bad knees, but I don't. I gave all for my art. Dr. Quinn's most memorable subjects required delicate treatment. None more so than when the town received a visit from the KKK. I just remember that particular episode about the KKK being really good. And I thought the way we handled that and the way the actors played that was just beautiful. Now you can live here. No! Grace, no! It was, you know, sometimes tough to do some of these shows because they, they were so much like still the way people act today towards one another. You know, that hasn't changed. People still hate people for stupid reasons. The incendiary topic also evoked powerful feelings on the part of the actors with respect to their characters. After I found out that the Ku Klux Klan had beaten Robert E., who was the guy who ran the blacksmith shop, my friend, after they had beaten him, they had me stay in this organization. And I said, there's no way, citing Horace's background, that he would ever do anything like that. He would stay in an organization like that. I was supposed to hang Robert E. Or, or start to hang him. And I said to Beth, I can't do this. And she, she got really upset with me. And I said, Beth, I'm right about this. That was the only time in the whole six years that I was on the show that I questioned what the writers wrote. Another moving storyline was based, in fact, on a devastating event that happened in November of 1868. A lot of, a lot of the, the crimes that we committed on um, Native American people were shown in a very human way, and you, you suddenly realize now we understand how inhuman we were. And the massacre that took place at Washita, I think something like 900 uh, Indians were killed. These were Native American people. We knew, we loved them. And my gosh, you know, that, that, those are our friends. They, kept, they were on our TV every week, and now they're dead. We rode in, and it was after they had burned the sets and put out the extras, and to see that many bodies and to see that kind of carnage it kind of struck you when is the killing going to stop can you not see what's before you it is finished we had our own genocide going there and i think that was dealt with in a in a really really good way while critics can debate moments both high and low dr quinn medicine woman will long be remembered as a fan favorite and a special time for the cast and crew this is a very very close group of people we really went through a lot, all of us. Um, we worked such intense hours that this was our life. And uh, when we go back to Paramount Ranch and we walk around there, there's tears in our eyes because they've torn down some of our favorite places. And it's a 
full of wonderful memories. <laughs>